Hello, my name is Oliver and welcome to my workshop. Up to now, we've been working away on the integral roll cage for Pandora, which will sit inside the chassis and be an integral structural component of our finished car and the basis and jig for building our floor pan. But the reason why we haven't gone rear wood of that or forward of that is because we have lacked material. Way back when, when I ordered the material for this integral roll cage, I got as much as I could, but we had a little mishap when we were building our own pipe bender, which meant we were one length of tube down. And then all the lockdowns happened and all happened and all of that. Which meant that there were months wait for <laughs> for tubing. Luckily, I've now managed to get some. We ended up emailing pretty much every single steel supplier in France. Eventually sending emails to Germany and Holland. And it just so happened the Dutch company was setting up a French raw cage tubing company. And they were just getting started. They weren't even properly open yet. And they referred us over to their French arm. Who because they weren't properly open yet. Had the tubing in stock. So that's great news, we finally have the tubing to make the front and rear of the car and we also have the other parts that we need. Allow me to explain. One of the most common mistakes in building a car of any sort, whether it's modifying a road car, restoring and, and resto modding a car, or it's just building a race car from scratch, is making it up as you go along. You can really easily paint yourself into a corner. You know, like when you paint a floor like this. If you don't choose where you're starting and choose where you're finishing, you can end up in a spot you really don't want to be in. And then you end up making compromises and everything ends up not as good as it could be and as good as it should be. So I've had to wait until I've been able to amass all of these parts in order to move forward. The width of Pandora is dictated by my drive shafts. That's the width of the car and that's the width that this car has to be. This suspension can't be closer or further away, that's the track width. It is what it is, that's the dictated width. So I couldn't do the front suspension until I had the rear suspension all here and sorted. Another thing that I've had to do and I've managed to do is get myself some engine mounts. Now, I would, <laughs> these are Hasport engine mounts. They're made in America, in California, and they are incredibly expensive. And I actually didn't think I'd be able to get some. One, because we're in France and you've got import and all of that. And the other is that, obviously I'm building this car all myself. So I was actually just going to make my own engine mounts. And then I found these online and they were actually second hand and they've never been put on a car. These have never been fitted. And they are the um, Firma polyurethane. These are actually like race car engine mounts. But they are for a DC5, which is what that engine came out of. This engine is from an Integra Type R DC5 rally car. And these are Integra Type R DC5 engine mounts, which is great news. The reason I was able to get them for such a good price is I bought them off a lady who was actually cleaning out her garage. And these engine mounts have been sat in a box on a shelf in her garage from her husband for over a decade. But they've never been fitted and they've never been exposed to sunlight. So <laughs> that's great news. And they just pop off. So that's great news, they bolt on like that and so that can help me get the width of the rear of the chassis where it needs to be. And uh, I've also got a rear engine mount and a gearbox side engine mount. They are slightly firmer polyurethane than I really wanted to use but the great thing about these is that I can actually change the polyurethane that's in the mounts in the future if I find them too firm. But I actually think they'll be okay. They're not as firm as I was led to believe, which is great news. So, 
what I'm going to do today is I'm going to actually lay everything out like I have and I'm going to sort out all of my geometries because everything is dictated by the rear suspension on this car. So my rear suspension geometry has to be right and my track width has to be right and then I can plan the front end of my car and the rear end of my car because I plan on getting rid of the subframes completely. You see this car originally had mini subframes and mini subframes are incredibly heavy and without an engine that leaks oil rather rust prone and they're not that strong and they're not that stiff on top of which and I now have an engine that makes a hundred percent more power than the original so my original mini front subframe just isn't going to fit one of the biggest problems with working on a mid-engine car of any sort, let alone one that's this small, is actually getting to the engine and working on the engine. Because this is the hole that I have. That's it. I can't make it any bigger. That's the hole that it is. And this engine is bigger than the hole. And it's always, working on a, an engine of a mid-engine car is like working on an engine through a post box or a mailbox if you're American and that's no good so what we're going to do is we are going to instead of making a subframe that sits like this that you sit the engine in and then putting a body on it and then if I have to work on the engine or remove the engine I have to remove the body of the car instead what we're going to do is we are going to suspend the engine from above, we're actually going to hang the engine from the chassis. So the engine is going to be here, and all of the structure is going to be above. This allows me to integrate my suspension mounting points into my chassis. It allows me to, if I ever need to remove the engine, I can undo the engine mounts, lift up the body, and leave the engine on a pallet just like you do on a 911. One of the reasons why every single job on a Porsche 911 starts with remove engine is because it's so easy to do. Because all you have to do is unbolt a few bolts and lift her up. So I'll be able to drop the engine and gearbox as one unit quickly, simply and easily. Which is great news. As well as having all the suspension and everything integral. When people just make it up as they go along, you end up with a bunch of compromises and a bunch of problems. Whereas here, everything is designed to work together from beginning to end. Because my biggest pet hate of, on any sort of car, whether it's a project car, whether it's a factory built car, because it does happen, even on factory built cars, is a bracket to a bracket. And a bolt-on subframe on a thing that I'm making, on a chassis and a floor pan that I'm making, is a bracket to a bracket to a bracket. Because you've got a chassis, then you have a subframe, then you have engine mounts, then you have an engine. That's no good. So this entire thing needs to work together, it needs to be cohesive. Now I've had some questions about the weight of this integral roll cage. People asking me, how heavy is it? Is it heavier than the original floor pan? and obviously we've got no floors in it yet and if it looks a bit unfinished that's because it is we're currently welding it up and we have to do it systematically so that we don't introduce too much heat into one point of the cage so we have to weld a bit then cool it with an airline then weld a bit somewhere else then cool it with an airline because if you just weld it from one corner to another you introduce a lot of heat and that can create distortion so so it stays square and level and as it's supposed to be we have to take our time doing it but just to show you how heavy it is I can actually pick it up it's not heavy at all it's 42.6 kilos in total is it 42.6? yep yay it's uh I'm, happy. I'm very very happy with it now in in contrast, this weighs a little bit more than one of the subframes from the Mini. 20... 27.9 kilos for one Mini subframe. The floor pan 
the original floor pan actually takes two people to lift I can't lift that on my own it's so heavy and this is why it's a such a good idea to make our rear of our chassis and our front of our chassis integral into the integrated subframe subframe roll cage because Obviously, this is so light, so more of it is a very good idea. And these uh, can, uh, can go in the bin. Uh, go for heavy. So this is the basic layout of the drivetrain. And it's been Bit difficult to work it all out really because no one has ever done this before there's no forum I can go on to just look it up and a lot of the information out there is from America which is a bit of a problem because this engine doesn't exist in America America never got unless it's imported America never got the Integra Type R and they never got the um, EP3 Civic Type R and so if you want a set of shafts like this in America which are Honda Civic R shafts you have to import them from Japan but the one thing Americans do have is a lot of base model Honda stuff which I cannot get hold of the Hondas that exist in France are either Honda Type R's or diesel <laughs> and so I <laughs> in working all this out I've realized that I need one custom part and that is the hubs because there's two sorts of Honda hubs. There are some small diameter ones and there are the big 36 mil ones. And 36 mil is the size of the nut that goes on the end of the axle. And the shafts that a CRV uses are the small sort. And so I can get, even the CRVs that I've found are all diesel. <laughs> like there's no, there's no base model Honda stuff at all in France. And so I'm going to have to buy from America some fancy chrome molly drive hubs that, uh, that will work with my Type R axles. Now you might think, well, why don't I just import some base model axles and then I can use the 4x100 that came on the base Civics in America and stuff like that, and the diesels. Well, Honda made the Type R axles for a reason. And I don't want to use five bolts because I don't want to use giant wheels. Big wheels on this car simply don't fit. And so it, I've, I'm in a bit of a predicament really where I have to have the 4x100, which is the same 4x100 as my Mazda front suspension. And I don't want to use the weaker axles because Honda made them for a reason. And not only that, believe it or not, my shafts will be under greater strain in Pandora than they would have been in a car that weighs double what Pandora will because she's actually mid-engined and in a front wheel drive car you don't have a lot of grip you end up with a lot of wheel speed because when you set off from, from a, when you launch it basically all your weight transfer goes backwards and you can spin weight you spin your tires and then you set off in a mid-engine car, when I launch it, all the weight comes backwards onto the back wheels and she sets off. So I actually have grip. In fact, I've got loads of grip because a K-series is a counter-rotating engine, a lot like a Mini. And so instead of it rocking that way when it sets off, it actually rocks this way. So the whole inertia of the rotation of the engine will transfer itself into the back tires and send me down the road. I shouldn't actually get any wheel spin whatsoever, which is why I'm not bothered about having a, a limited slip diff. Um, having an LSD or a limited slip diff in a mid-engine car can be a bad thing as well as being a good thing. And so I'm actually going to wait and, and set this car up before I even think about having a diff in it because this car will have so much grip that even just setting off with one wheel it might just grip and go and uh, coming out of a corner in a mid-engine car can actually be a lot better if you don't have a limited slip diff which is why Lotuses and up to now McLarens haven't had a limited slip diff either because it can create more problems than it solves but uh, this will be a very very fast accelerating car 
And so going for shafts that are rated only for 200 brake horsepower isn't really a good idea. Whereas these are the, the uh, Honda Civic Type R shafts are much better. And of course, on top of that, we have uh, this engine is not just a standard Type R engine. It has cams, it has the bigger manifold, it has bigger fuel injectors, it has a bigger throttle body, and it'll have um, a, a custom exhaust as well, of course. So we're going to be putting down a lot of power and to create a weak point in between some sticky tires and a really strong engine is a really bad idea. So I'm going to have to import some hubs from America. It's now a lot of maths later. I don't know exactly what time it is, but it is going dark. <laughs> um, and we've spent ages measuring everything up. Um, I know it looks the way that it did a few episodes ago when we had it all just balanced on the table, but now for the first time ever, it's all in the correct place. The way that we did it was, we looked at the overall tire diameter of a Honda CRV as recommended by Honda, and the ride heights and all of that. Then we cross-referenced that with a DC5 Integra Type R, because it's rough with the same suspension design and geometry. And obviously one's a four-wheel drive and one's a road car, and we want it to be a road car, just with a lot of suspension travel. So we did that, and then we worked out our camber and our caster and all the rest of it. It is all going to be adjustable, but we want to get it as close as we can first time off. And, um, and then that way, once everything is adjustable, we can spend time really finely dialing it in. Now the roll cage needs rear stays on it anyway, otherwise it wouldn't be much for a roll cage. So we might as well incorporate the rear stays into the thing that holds the engine and suspension up the back of the chassis. So what we're going to do, we're going to come down here, past the engine, past these top suspension points, round, and past these points as well, so that it can tie everything in together and has as little bend, as fewer bends as possible. Because the key to making a roll cage that works, the key to chassis strength, is as few bends as possible, where you have a bend, then met by another tube, and you never use a tube in bending, so you never apply a bending force to the middle of a tube. Um, so you never have like a T-piece like that, so it, it pushes on it. Because that's a really bad idea. So, I think that keeps it nice and simple. I just need to make a cardboard template now. I've got my lovely lavender masking tape. I just need to cut out some cardboard bends. So something like this, which comes close to this mount and this mount and this mount. And I need to mark my center line now. And then we need to bend up a piece of tubing. So, since you last saw me, I've, uh, I've had a bit of an epic. <laughs> so, this piece of the pipe bender here, if you come and have a look. In here there's a piece of, a very thick piece of steel. And uh, that bent, and then I fixed that, and then the acros bent. That is one of the levers for this absolute monstrosity. Which, if, <laughs> if you're just seeing this for the first time, this is my homemade pipe bender that I made in lockdown number two, because I couldn't get a pipe like that. And, unfortunately, is broken. So, it's too late to fix it now, and I'm nearly there, but I'll show you what it'll look like anyway. I was hoping to be able to cut it to length, notch it, the whole thing, but it's just not doable tonight. And so, I'm gonna pop it out, and, uh, and I'll show you what it looks like. That end's all right, it's just this end that's, uh, that's sadly not bent enough. 
But tomorrow I shall fix it. Well, no, tomorrow I've got to upload this video. <laughs> tomorrow morning, because it goes up in the afternoon. But then tomorrow afternoon I'll fix this and uh, finish bending it, notch it, and uh, proper progress for next week. It is what it is, but I'll show you what it'll look like anyway. So if the pipe bender hadn't have broken, this is kind of what it would look like. And uh, I'm really happy with it. Obviously not happy with the pipe bender and, uh, <laughs> and it, it doesn't fit, but I'll sort it out. It's one of those things, someone said in the comment section the other day, does nothing ever go wrong for you, Oliver? Yes, yes it does, and I'm blaming you. Uh, no, I'm not. It's my fault. But there we go. These things happen. And uh, we'll sort it out. But not today. It just goes to show, not everything always goes to plan. And I could have just, like, not filmed this bit. But it's important that people know that, you know, no matter how well prepared you are, not everything always goes to plan. And sometimes equipment fails, and sometimes your brain fails. And uh, it doesn't matter because we'll sort it out tomorrow. But that's all for me today. So if you'd like to support this channel and, and support the building of Pandora, please make sure you subscribe. It's literally the best thing that you can do. The next best things you can do are telling your friends that this channel exists and clicking like. And if you'd like to leave a comment down below, then uh, please feel free to do so. I read every single one of them. Thank you all for watching. Please be awesome to each other. And remember, if you can't afford your dreams, just build them.